Um, today I'm going to talk about non-operative knee and hip treatments. Um, this is my disclosures. None of these have any influence on what I have to discuss today. Um, so case presentation with a discussion and then the didactics to follow. So my case, I saw this gentleman about two months ago, um, 89 year old, 11 year history of right more than left non-traumatic knee pain. Started intermittently, um, then became constant when he, by the time he saw me, standing with and walking was the was most painful for the past two years. Sitting, he had one out of 10 pain. Laying, two out of 10 pain. Standing, walking, he had 10 out of 10 pain. His pain was localized medial joint and anterior joint. He described it as sharp, stabbing, and stiff. Um, knee felt unstable, buckled a few times um, due to his pain. Um, when view assist was pretty much negative, except that he had a little bit of grating and tingling to the left side, uh, to his left knee. He has a complicated medical history. Um, he ruptured his aortic uh, aneurysm in 2006 and had a long recovery course after that with a pacemaker. Um, he also had a recent um, ankle fracture with infected hardware that had to be, be removed and he was currently going to rehab when I met him for that. Um, he's on blood thinners and, and an SSRI. Um, he's had a history of smoking for four years, um, but quit when he was, I think, 70. Um, he walks with a front-wheel walker with supervision. He needs minimal assistance for his self-care, and he has a home health aid. On physical exam, he walks with a forward lean. Um, um, he has a preference to his left lower extremity. His right knee was slightly swollen um, with a varus deformity. His right knee was tendered at a mule joint. His neurologic exam was intact and symmetric. His right knee flexion was 100. Um, degrees. Extension was 5 degrees. Left knee was 110. Extension was 0. Um, dual tension signs were negative, so no femoral stretch or straight leg raise. Um, with um, back range of motion, he did have some thigh pain with extension and um, worse tingling on the left side. Um, his hips were quiet. With ligamentous exam, he did have mild laxity with valgus stress uh, with medial compartment opening, and he's borderline overweight at 25. Um, BMI. So here's a look at his imaging. He had severe OA at the right knee compartment, the right knee. His uh, sunrise or merchant views are you know, okay, nothing severe there, as, as likewise as his um, lateral views. So his previous treatment um, course, so like I said, 10 year, 11 years ago, he had, he had a um, started having symptoms. A year into his symptoms, he started um, as, um, Advil, got steroid injections for the right knee. Um, he refused PT at the time. He just wanted a quick fix and keep, you know, keep keep on going with his life. Um, he did trial um, NSAIDs temporarily, and that helped moderate, you know, a little bit. Um, he wasn't able to take it for a long time because of he was of the blood thinners. Um, he his, his steroid injections only lasted about two months and gave him moderate uh, moderate relief. Then the next year, following year, he had started two parts injections to the right knee, which gave him high moderate relief. He did that for about three years, every six months, and he was, he was doing great. Um, but then after that, it stopped, stopped working for him. He was referred to surgery, but he declined because of his complex medical history, his PCP was concerned. Um, then he started physical therapy for the first time in 2016, um, and he, he received appropriate therapy with low impact strength and exercise with a home exercise program. They also tagged on TENS unit, topical, Voltaren, um, a lateral heel, heel wedge, but gave him back pain, suspected he had spinal stenosis, so lifting his back heel um, worsened his back pain. He was given an offload of brace, but he felt it too difficult to take on and off, um, and it also started giving him lateral knee pain in his right knee. He came to HSS in 2017 for the first time. He was given other trial suit parts, but did not get any um, relief from that. Um, he was then also treated for a left L4 radiculopathy, which resolved with an epidural steroid injection and physical therapy. Um, it was covered with his left knee symptoms. And then for his right knee, he was given a ho home exercise with um, stationary bike, and which helped for about two years, just a little bit. Then he's changed his doctors. He saw me for the first time about two months ago. He was looking for alternatives. Um, he, he knew that surgery was not without a question. So, um, and, and he was already going through PT and upper his ankle and he had that time. So I kind of sat down with him. I went through 
all the possible options. Um, this is what a lot of us agree on, you know, and says physical therapy. He hasn't tried, he wasn't advised on weight loss counseling, but I didn't, I didn't, I didn't uh, discuss that with him because he was elderly. Um, it's very difficult to lose weight at that age, especially when you have multiple comorbidities. Um, and tramadol was an opioid, or, or opioid management was something also discussed. Um, he, he, was, he was not interested because of the side effects he's had with previous um, opioid um, trials. And steroid injections just weren't working long enough for him. So then we started talking about alternative treatments like acupuncture, and he wasn't interested in doing that because he didn't want to go to acupuncture several times a month for the rest of his life. Um, we talked about we talked about uh, supplements, glucosamine and conjointin and turmeric. Um, he said he's tried those on his own um, with no with no re re results. So we're we're kind of you know things are our options are running thin now, and so we you know we start talking about more experimental things like the biologics like PRP and stem cells. Um, I you know I, I I touched on it a little bit, but I, I personally don't find any um, um, I don't see much success with someone who has has that, uh, and those, the type of um, osteoarthritis he has at this stage. So we last thing we discussed was joint uh, of the radio frequency ablation of the knee. Um, so he went ahead and got that done. Before we actually did the radio frequency ablation, we had to kind of confirm that, you know, if we blocked his genicular nerves or if we ablated them, um, if they would, he would get some kind of relief. So to come, kind of do a test and also diagnose his issue, we, uh, on the fluoroscopy, I went in and um, these are, this is the contrast that I just confirmed where the medication is going to end up. I, I inject 0.5 ml of, zero, of opipubicane for his um, superior and, and, and one inferior genicular nerves. And he got about 60% relief with that, um, and with walking and standing specifically. So he, that, cut, that makes the criteria. So I went on and gave him a radiofixy ablation, and this is the needle placement foot ablation for needle ablation here. Um, so the outcomes, the two-week follow-up, he had 50% improvement. He no, he no longer had stabbing pain or sharp symptoms. It changed to more of a dull ache. He was able to stand and walk with five out of 10 pain instead of 10 out of 10 pain. Um, his only medication he was taking for pain was acetaminophen, and that actually started helping him even more. He brought his pain down to three out of 10. Um, despite long conversations on the phone prior to the the procedure, he was disappointed that he did not regain his range of motion in his knee, but he was already in physical therapy. So I'm hoping that he would um, be able to maybe progress with range of motion, possibly uh, with his physical therapy sessions. Um, I see him again in, for a six week fall next week, actually. Um, so I guess to open up discussion here before I go into didactics, um, how would folks treat someone like this? Yeah. So. Uh... Uh, George, thanks for a, a great presentation. I think obviously a very uh, challenged patient in regards to the medical comorbidities, uh, elderly with lots of problems. I think even as uh, even the surgeons on the panel uh, would agree that this is a, a patient that we want to take on uh, from a surgical standpoint uh, very, very hesitantly. Um, uh, the the question I have is uh, that uh, uh, Jonathan had was, do you have any experience with cryoablation as opposed to radioablation, uh, pros and cons, one over the other? Um, with, uh, no, I, I haven't had exp personal experience with the cryoablation. Um, I, 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 I use what we call cool RF, which is like a lower temperature ablation that we usually use now because it gives you a bigger, um, um, I would say a bigger area of ablation, and I'll talk about that in the didactic portion. But um, I haven't had any experience with that now. Another question is, how long do you expect the the relief to be? Um, you know, you have relatively early uh, follow up on this particular patient, but in your experience, how how long does the the the, the pain relief last? Yeah, so I personally have I've done uh, probably a close to a hundred of these, and it between nine to twelve months they have. Pretty significant improvement, averaging about fifty to seventy percent. And do you do do you follow up? Uh, do you do you repeat it at all, or any experience in repeating? Yes, so I do. I, you know, when, when I do have a, a six week and then a three month and then a six month follow up, and at the six month follow up, sometimes they have the symptoms coming back a little bit, so we wait another maybe three months and repeat it then if need be. Um. And any sort of complications, any neuromas that have formed or anything like that that, that uh, 
you know, worsen the, the symptoms. Right. So, you know, so the, the, the formation of an aroma is, is, is a risk factor as well as uh, hematoma. So sometimes you have these neurovascular bundles and you can actually um, ablate and open up the, uh, the vascular structures and injure them. Um, I personally haven't, but that is something that's in the literature that's, um, that's pretty pertinent, especially when, you, when we're talking about the hip ablations. Great. Hey, George, uh, you know, when we do these injections in the surgery, a lot of the surgeons here will actually do periarticular injections. Our aim is to sometimes infiltrate the periosteum because we think that gives the most pain relief. Are you focusing solely on the genicular nerves? Or are you trying to get to the periosteum? Um, do you think there's a role for both? What, do you, what are your thoughts on the technique? Yeah. Yeah, actually, I am trying to get the periosteum. So I, I try to get the ablation right next to it, um, the, the needle right next to the periosteum. But get, get, if I get it too close to the periosteum, then you, you may not get the ablation area that you want. So you kind of have get a little distance, but you want to get the, get the periosteum captured in your ablation um, radius. Right. Uh, Mike or, or Brian, any questions? No, I mean, I think it's quite an exhaustive uh, approach. I think, uh, you know, as you mentioned, Matias, I think we'd all be hesitant to operate, to operate on this patient. Uh, I was curious how well the, the diagnostic block correlates with what you see with the radiofrequency ablation. You mentioned you got, what do you use as your threshold? You mentioned 60%, and it sounds like that correlated pretty well with the relief that he got clinically with the, with the ablation. Right. So we typically would see something like 50 to 60 percent um, because you're getting three of, of out of the five nerves that innervate the sensory nerves that innervate the joint. So you don't expect to get 100 percent ever. Um, so getting 60 or 50 is actually kind of like maximum like what I, I, I would expect. Yeah. And is that just a George? Is that just a patient reported VAS scale yeah. that, that they use? Yeah. OK. Yeah. OK. Very good. Uh, there's a question in the uh, in the chat room about using CPT products, uh, and I think all of us have uh, hear about this. I my understanding is relatively um, uh, limited, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, any thoughts about CPD and and uh, and and how to uh, use that in in your in your portfolio of uh, of, uh, of potential uh, modifying agents? That's yeah, a good that's cover a, that's, up there. It's a <laughs> it's a hot topic, and it's it's and it's it's like the, it's like the supplements. There's not exact science to it. We we don't. There's no dosing that we could say. Okay, go to this dispensary and get this milligram dose of CBD. It's kind of you go there, you get the gummy bear, and you have the patient try. It's very hit and miss. Um, but for those who get it uh, uh, and get relief, it's pretty significant. And I don't generally see that in someone who has advanced OA. Um, you, one more question. Uh, uh, Mike, go ahead, please. Well, it's not tons to add. Um, and I think the care George delivered was exemplary and like uh, Springer said, exhaustive. Um, not that it's the, not that it's the, you know, we've sort of developed, Bill Duranic developed this program at Duke with the help of others where, you know, we try to have this care um, live certainly with the uh, physicians, but <clears throat> also try to uh, provide I guess what we think is a little more comprehensive approach than we used to, we call it the joint health program. There's nothing proprietary. In all honesty, it's run by our physical therapists. They get a little extra training in arthritis care delivery. And, and the only things that I think they add that maybe wasn't mentioned, but I'm sure it was provided by George, but you know, we're even things around so, some of the supplements, education around supplements, best we know, and even some education, not for diet, just for weight loss, but diet related to pro-inflammatory you know, sort of food sources that may be considered, you know, healthy from a standpoint of what type of food they are, but may actually, as we know, in some cases be, you know, uh, aggravating, if you will. So there, there's things like that. And, and all those patients are tracked longitudinally um, with PROMs, you know, in an effort to see if these conservative efforts are actually making, a, making an effect or making a true change. So, yeah, I, no, I, I agree. Think, uh, Looking at this from a in, a in a rigorous manner, I think is really important with all these new these different modalities. Uh, in in the interest of time, George, why don't you go ahead and, and shift into the didactic okay. portion of your of your presentation? Okay, so I'll quickly go through the the, the introduction and history and evidence for the radiofrequency ablation hip and knee. 
focusing more on the knee. So, you know, it, it has comes by var various names, radio frequency ablation, radio, radio frequency denervation, neurotomy, rhizotomy. Um, it was initially developed for tumors. Um, first nerve was ablated in 1931. It was trigeminal for trigeminal neuralgia. Um, there's strong evidence now for, and it kind of blossomed from there, there's strong evidence now for the spinal facet joints. Um, and it's, you know, folks will say, well, you're getting your nerves burned. Well, not exactly. Um, the way that this works is you have this tip of the needle and, and the rest of the needle is um, insulated that stimulates the ions in the tissue and the ions moving back and forth against each other heat up from friction. And that's how you get the... Um, the heat, because if it was just a heated needle, then you would get a char, and you would get maybe much translation across the tissue to get your to get your burn or your your heat. Um, so indications. So Medicare is this is Medicare's indication. So moderate to severe knee pain, um, more than six months, you fail therapy. Um, you have you know grade two to four um, disease. You respond fifty percent or more to a diagnostic injection. Um, the literature is not very hefty when it comes to this procedure, particularly. Uh, we have one double blindly randomized controlled trial with 38 patients um, with significant results. I mean, everyone got at least 50%. Um, a lot of the other um, tests and, and studies were done on cadavers just to, just to kind of prove the point that, you, that what, when you're using fluoroscopy to um, numb the nerves that you, you could get you could get a pretty accurate um, placement just using fluoroscopy. I tend to like to use um, a supplement with ultrasound because I want to avoid the vascular structures. Um, so that's our biggest study for this is done by Tim Davis out in California. He had 150 one patient, so across 11 um, offices, and had significant results as well. Um, so the technique we use, with, um, we use fluoroscopy. We have, um, you know, we, we have, we know the landmarks. We're trying to get right at the junction of the shaft of the, uh, the femur uh, right before we get to the condyle. You know, place it not right on top of the osteum, but close to it. So you get the nice um, um, and capture of the os os periosteum and the nerve. Uh, you could, there's also cases where patients have, who had post-operative pain, so those patients who got, got their, knee, their knee replaced and still have knee pain, granted you ruled out hip problems and lower back issues, and it's truly hip, uh, sorry, truly a knee joint issue. Um, we've, we've, I've actually done one of these and had good results. Um, major precautions, um, you know, we want to make sure we don't um, denerv denervate motor um, to motor nerves, so we actually do a test stimulated simulation without heat before we burn to make sure nothing downstream is moving. Um, and then, you know, this, you know, the, you can also get scarring if, let's say, someone's very thin, um, and and the the, the 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 ablation gets, you know, captures the skin tissue. Um, so let's move quickly to the hip joint. Um, there's no Medicare um, guidelines for this, but I, when I do them, which I've done a few, um, I kind of carry on what I do for the hip, um, for, sorry, for the knee. Um, the, the, the studies for, the evidence for this is very, very scant, um, mostly case um, reports and um, case series. Um, the, 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 the nerves that they are going after are the articular branches of the femoral and the obturator nerve. Um, if you look closely here on the MRI view here, axial view, the, the targets are right on the periosteum and the anterior hip, but you want to be sure to avoid the, the, you know, the, the nerves and the femoral nerve artery here, because um, this has a very, in, in these small cases, we have this very high um, complication rate with um, nerve damage and um, hematomas. So like any procedure, we, you know, we, drape, we, we we sterilize and drape the patient. We the photofemoral branch it's at the twelve o'clock portion of the acetabulum, and then for the obturator branch is at the anterior surface of the ischium. And this is just placement of the needle for the for the uh, femoral and placement for the needle for the obturator branch. Obturator branch has a larger um, var variance. So for the obturator branch, we have to do several um, passes with the needle to get the, to make sure we get it um, taken care of. And the highest risk here, if you can imagine what we're dealing with here, um, and especially with needles, and especially, especially if you don't use ultrasound to do this procedure, because uh, you know, this is not an open procedure, um, 
significant, there's a high chance of, of vascular injury, about neurovascular injury. Um, so I guess I'll just conclude now. Um, new, so there's numerous non-surgical pathways available for patients for hip and knee problem OA. Um, there are several knowledge gaps when it comes to the many commonly used and emerging treatments. Um, complicated patients like you saw today um, with advanced OA may need to explore these emerging treatments because a lot of many of these uh, other tried and true treatments may not uh, work for someone with um, severe advanced disease. Um, thank you so much for your time today.